Okay, so we're excited to get started. This year we have been working on a number of partnerships to advance quantum computational science to solve valuable problems. So today we're gonna take some time to talk a little bit about how these collaborations work so that we can solve problems for quantum computational science. Okay, so I have my panelists here today, and let's kick off the conversation. I think, Travis, I'm gonna start with you. Um, I wanna know, what do you think about how classical and quantum computing will work together to solve problems for materials and other uh, use cases as well? Oh, thanks a lot, Jamie, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, for those who don't know, Oak Ridge National Laboratory is one of the Department of Energy's research and development centers uh, located in Tennessee, and we are very interested in the material science issue, uh, both for the types of materials that we think can advance energy security, but also scientific discovery for its own right. Now, we are home to the spallation neutron source, the brightest source of neutrons in the world, as well as currently the world's fastest supercomputer uh, known as Frontier. And I want to focus on that. Uh, computing resource for the moment because using computation to understand and discover new principles of science is fundamental to what we do both as scientists but also as uh, part of the Department of Energy's mission. Uh, what is critical here is that quantum computing appears to provide a new tool, a platform in which we can enable new types of material science discovery. Uh, we find that some of the hardest problems correspond to strongly correlated systems. This could either be electrons, uh, high energy particles, other types of spins. In order to accurately simulate those systems, we do need new tools to address the types of scalable entanglement and coherence that arises in these materials in real life. Now, I see this intersection, therefore, as a merging of how we use currently high-performance computing systems to solve some of these problems with this new accelerator capability, uh, quantum computers. I'll give you a few examples of where I think this can happen. Uh, one is that we can directly try to simulate these materials, almost use a quantum computer to create a synthetic or computational material, a model that actually mimics the actual behavior of the systems that we're trying to characterize experimentally. That's a great direct brute force approach to how to use a quantum computer. An alternative is to actually think about how we balance the workflow, maybe embed a computation in the quantum computer that our classical computer can't solve efficiently. Uh, this could be a matter of scale. As we look at the granularity of these types of material simulations, the smaller we get in terms of energy and length scale, the more difficult it becomes to capture those strongly correlated dynamics. So, Jamie, maybe just to get to your point, the, the material science is absolutely a fundamentally exciting area, and quantum computing appears to offer a really novel approach to how to address that. Fantastic. I think that's great. I think uh, that leads very nicely into my next question that's for Kenny. Right. Um, Kenny, I want to know a little bit more about what barriers of adoption you see for quantum computing in the healthcare and life sciences, and what are some of the strategies that we can you know, put in place to drive usage and adoption? Yep, thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. I mean, it's absolutely been wonderful to be here. I've learned so much about uh, what's going on in this community, um, and I'm excited to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what's going on in healthcare and life sciences. Uh, I'm at the Cleveland Clinic, and I'm also involved in a white paper with a group of IBM investigators and colleagues around the world to try to like flesh out ideas for use cases in, in uh, healthcare and life sciences. I've also been in the field for 30 or 40 years, so I have a lot of my own ideas and things I, I want to pursue. Uh, also in discussions with colleagues from the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, just at lunch, uh, we had a wonderful conversation with some colleagues at a pharmaceutical company about what they think, you know, which is really the important uh, aspect of this. Um, and just, uh, I came here yesterday from a meeting in Spain, and uh, there's a lot of conversations about high resolution crystallography, and uh, had long conversations with colleagues there about how quantum computing could potentially facilitate our understanding of these very complicated uh, protein ligand systems or, or structures, uh, in material structures even. Um, so like the, the main things that come up constantly uh, in my discussions with colleagues in the field are really, uh, quantum chemistry is sort of the primary one, right? In computational chemistry or biology in my field, 
it's sort of the foundational method. So people are real excited about you know, advances in quantum chemistry and how that could be used to, say, build better potentials, create data sets to use uh, machine learning and AI. For example, the quantum crystallographer, he wanted to use quantum chemistry and quantum computing to uh, refine these crystal structures of protein ligand complexes. So that's one area that, that comes up all the time is, you know, how can we take advantage of this? Another one, of course, is it won't be any surprise to anybody if you you know, have been following the literature recently is uh, machine learning and AI. So what can uh, machine learning and AI, uh, what can quantum computing do to accelerate, build better models, build them faster? Uh, this is something, and this came up at, at lunch today uh, in detail, that they're you know, very interested in using these kinds of things. So what are the barriers, right? And, and to me, what was really exciting about the morning session is that some of these issues with the regards to the barriers were being addressed, right? There's an educational component, but you need to live where the scientists are, right? And so in the healthcare life sciences, we have user interfaces, we have GUIs. You know, people are very, very familiar with these. And so the challenge is like, okay, now you're telling me I have to learn another user interface. And so I think right. bringing yeah. kind of these tools to the, the users, to their user interface that they're very comfortable with, I think is really important. Um, obviously, you could you know, train them to use QuizKit, but I think for really rapid, fast adoption, you really want to have it kind of in their workspace, if you will. Um, so you know, training is a, a really uh, important component of, of this um, area. So in terms of um, you know, my field, I think the barriers are, are training. Oh, and um, sorry, the other point, that came up even at lunch is the killer application, right? Um, what is the application that's going to really address a key fundamental problem in healthcare and life sciences? And if you indeed create something that, say, every pharmaceutical company in the world needs in their workflow, they will adapt and adopt uh, these kinds of technologies very rapidly. Yep. So to really answer the question, I think we need, and I think John will talk a little bit more about training, uh, better training, bringing the technology to the, the um, user and developing those key applications. You're understanding the workflow and then building teams that are capable of going from the quantum information science all the way to the application. Yeah. So it could be an experimentalist, it you know, could be a computational chemist or biologist, and then a quantum information scientist. So yeah. I think those are really kind of the challenges that we face in our field. And then these workflows that you're referencing could be a combination of classical with quantum components, yes, absolutely. similar to what Travis Yeah, getting what describing. Travis is saying. And I think most, you know, even in the conversation today, most of the discussion was, yeah, you know, we have a workflow and there's one step that is, you know, slow and really amenable to a quantum device. Right. That's the one we're going to focus on accelerating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sort of what Travis is saying, like having this kind of mixed environment where you're going to use the quantum computing when it's really needed and not use it for, say, I.O. or something like that, right. right? And that it's classically challenging. Right. Yeah, Jamie, exactly. if I can follow on to this, because sure. uh, like you're saying, Kenny, there are decades of existing methodology right. and data sets right. and standards for how these workflows are supposed to be executed, yeah. and you can't throw that out just because a new technology right. came along. Exactly. So it, it fundamentally is about integration. Right. Really good point. Yeah, there are standards, right? So expectations for certain problem solving. Okay, so that I think leads us nicely into our next question. So I wanted to ask Sophia, what do you see in terms of the potential for near-term quantum computing for the high energy physics area? So uh, I think high energy physics is one of those fields that really has very, very big computational challenges ahead. So you, you heard a little bit about us uh, during the end of the morning sessions. So fundamental fundamental questions about the universe are what we are trying to answer, right, with high energy physics. And CERN is one of is the, is the main lab where this is happening today. It's the biggest one, for sure. Now, the point is that we, are, we know already that the computational models we use so far will only, you know, allow us to do basically the next 10 years physics. But if we look into the next generation colliders, that won't be enough. And so, what we really need to do is to start looking for new technologies, and that's why we started looking into quantum already a few years ago. And what we are seeing is that there are quite a few problems that we can start solving even today. So it's a still relatively small scale, 
but they are very, very important results because they tell us, they show that we can use quantum computers to do simulation, for example. So being able to simulate our theoretical models will give us you know, information about what are the next um, areas that we should survey with our detectors. Um, at the same time, we can use quantum computers to speed up and improve data processing. So this is a very, very big challenge for CERN and the high energy physics community in general. The point is that you've probably seen pictures of our detectors. Those are very big 3D <coughs> cameras, okay? And, and so what you need to be able to, to make sense of is millions and millions of sensors, which in fact are needed to, to, to reproduce physics quantities. And so all of those physics quantities, they have quantum nature behind them. Mm -hmm. And that's why we can actually uh, make sense of them using quantum algorithms in a way that is very, very powerful even today. Now, size is still a problem, mm -hmm. but those exciting news we heard about today with the announcements at yeah. the roadmap, they really make us think we're getting closer and closer to very realistic application very soon. And this is something that's very important for us. So typically, w the way we solve our problems is, is really using multi-step, multi-layered algorithms, we go from uh, analyzing data in one detector to the next one and the next one. And so this is typically a, work, a workload or an algorithm or a set of algorithms that can easily map to this idea of having quantum computing and HPC integrated even over a short term. Okay, so this is really something that we think we'll be able to, to use for realistic applications very soon. Mm -hmm. um, now, the other thing, the other point I wanted to make is also that uh, we measure lifetime of our experiments in decades, right. okay? Right now we have a program that is set, I would say, for the end of 2040, 2050, okay? It's pretty, pretty far away in time, but we are already trying to plan what to do next, okay? So this is, if you think about it, it's a very long time scale that allows us also to dream a little bit. So one thing, one idea I wanted to push and just here really leveraging my, you know, Experimental physicist side is wondering whether we could see at some point combination between computing and quantum sensing in such a way that we could really build integrated detectors of unprecedented accuracy. So this is kind of a dream, a very long-term dream that uh, would make a big difference in our field. Yeah, so amazing the time scales that you guys are working yeah. on in terms of the experiments and getting ready for it, preparing for it ahead of time. And uh, so in that way, you do have the chance to plan ahead for like the devices of the yes. future. Yes, and I think, I mean, one of the important things we learned about this exercise, this idea of building working groups uh -huh. dedicated to this, to this domain, this is really something that helped us prioritize and look at problems in a, in a different way than what we typically do when we are trying to solve them daily, right? So yeah. it allowed us to talk to other communities, uh, theoreticians and experimentalists really could work together in a way that, you know, it doesn't always happen so efficiently daily, I would say. And this really helped us prioritize and mm -hmm. process, um, on, on the future use cases. Yeah, and the other thing I, I really like about, you know, some of the discussions we've had of, is you've talked about using quantum computers as an instrument. Yes. And so it's just, it's another way of thinking about how you might actually use quantum computing for high energy physics. Yes, so, so, so as I said, the idea of, so, the instrument, so something as the sensor, a part of the detector that will really capture the interaction of a particle, the, 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 the information that we are trying to learn, that is something that is extremely exciting. Yeah, yeah. Excellent, thank you so much, Sophia. So um, I'm, I think, going to move to John and ask a, a question to John on what does, uh, what does utility mean uh, to RPI um, and its ecosystem? Uh, terrific, uh, and thanks for the question. Uh, and this is great. This morning was great listening to all the, the uh, things that are coming along. It's wonderful with colleagues like this that are uh, thinking long term in terms of what do we do. Um, uh, let me back up a little bit. Uh, RPI is the oldest technological university in this country, the US, um, and it was originally founded with the motto of uh, application of science for the common purposes of life. And I think quantum is application of science for the common purposes of life. So we're just continuing on in that mission. Uh, similar to what uh, the other three speakers have talked about, uh, we have a very large um, high-performance computing 
system, about an eight petaflop system on campus, so we've been in HPC for a while. I think we'll see some of those techniques move. We'll see some of those techniques not move uh, to quantum. And uh, how do we have a composable environment uh, that we can uh, help uh, educate the next generation? And uh, Kenny alluded to it, but I, I, I think one of the real keys here is how do we get the next generation really excited about this? You know, like you know, the excitement we have in this room, and and we've all been vested in this, but. How do we get this next generation excited about uh, quantum computing and, and really vesting themselves? I can tell you on our campus, we're in the process of putting a system one in place that'll be operational in March. Um, and I can't go just about anywhere on campus without a group of undergraduates. As soon as I say the word quantum, they're swarming all around me. <laughs> and it's just wonderful. It's wonderful what they, they want to do and uh, what they see for the future. I'm not sure they have the 10 or 20 or 30 year view that Sophia has, <laughs> but uh, they have about the two or three day view, but uh, <laughs> that's okay, we'll, we'll work with that and try to uh, manage that uh, excitement and that passion. Um, and they're gonna teach us a few things as they go through a learning exper experiments of things that maybe we wouldn't try because we're, we're farther along the path, if, if you will. But um, I'm very excited about what we can do with the next generation. If you look at RPI, we're about 85% uh, science and engineering uh, in our student body. Uh, and about half of that are pretty intensive in computing, computer science, IT, computer systems engineering. So these are the folks that, uh, you know, we'd like to get really excited about helping the IBMs and partners and others uh, figure things out as, uh, as we go through this. And uh, we already have, uh, it's kind of amusing, but we already have a, a club. Uh, the students, the undergraduate students, have already formed an, a quantum computing club, which I, uh, I shouldn't say this to this group, but sounded a little nerdy to me, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but they already got funding and they meet once a week and they talk quantum uh, for an hour. And I, I didn't think that was my college experience, but that is their college experience, <laughs> which is great. Um, and uh, yeah, how do, we, how do we keep harnessing that, keep in, encouraging them to go forward? I mentioned to all of you yesterday, uh, one of the questions I'm asked all the time is, by the undergraduates is, can I touch it and can I access it? And the answer is no and maybe. <laughs> um, no, you can't touch it, uh, but maybe if you get uh, connected with one of our faculty members or one of our researchers, uh, we'll get you access to the, uh, one of the quantum cues and get you going and see what you can do. And once again, they'll probably teach us a few things along the way. Yeah. So. But if I may just yeah. add into this, I think <coughs> our, our approachable this technology is becoming, or you're making it available on the cloud. How, now, now we are going, we've, we've seen AI for building, for building Cascade programs. Mm -hmm. This is something that's going to capture more and more attention, more and yeah. more enthusiasm in the younger generations. We are going to be flooded with requests of, you know, students coming to work on these kind of topics. Yeah. We need to get ready. Yeah, so there, it sounds like maybe I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads, a lot of enthusiasm from yeah. uh, students and, and oh, yeah, the future absolutely. generation, I guess, yes. of quantum computational sciences. Yep. Uh, Jamie, I actually absolutely think we're in an extremely creative period yeah. in the history of quantum computing right yeah. now. I mean, it is a, maybe not a golden age. That seems like we've got to wait before we use that phrase. <laughs> but um, It's a historical statement. Historical, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll come back to that. <laughs> yeah. But... But the number of opportunities that are available, both on the technology side, on the application side, um, these, these people know this, right? We know this, that's why we're all here. Um, mm -hmm. And how we best take advantage of that, I think, at least from my perspective, is something that I reflect on every day because I can be quick to adopt these new types of techniques, think about these workflows, how I wanna integrate them in there. But oftentimes, if we're not getting the feedback you know, or, or providing that feedback to the vendors and, and to the other end users and developers, then we can find ourselves wandering down, you know, endless, nameless roads. Mm -hmm. So this creativity comes with a risk, right? Which is we've got to learn how to balance our enthusiasm with the opportunities that are out there. And we can only do that when we have enough people, enough critical mass yeah. to enable that type of uh, collaboration. Right. So in, I would just comment like in, in my career, you know, as a grad student, I started out with single processor, you know, CPUs. And then uh, my advisor got a call from a company called Cray Research. I don't know how many of you remember Cray Research, but they said they had this vector machine and we got our code going and it was 500 times faster. And then, you know, a few years later, GPUs come online. It's 
500 times faster. You know, so I think, you know, you're not going to fool me this time. I want to be prepared when quantum <laughs> computing, you know, has this huge, it, you know, jump in performance for certain applications. So really, to follow on kind of your your comment, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah, if I could add too, uh, for us, uh, we have things called core requirements that go across all of our. Uh, various curricula and uh, for instance communications requirements things like that but we have something right now called data dexterity where you have to have two courses that have some level of manipulating data mm -hmm. doing data analytics and so on and I would see uh, I don't want to get ahead of the faculty but I, I expect that we'll have several courses that are required in quantum awareness uh, for all of our students hmm. and and this is going to change the way they learn and also the way we teach in terms of what's next and I, I mentioned just yesterday but it it's a ways back, but I always, I always remember this example of uh, when we first required uh, mobile computing laptops for all of our students, one of our faculty members came up to me and she said, well, you know, I used to always teach the ideal gas law. And by the way, I thought the ideal gas law was something that had to be taught to everybody. <laughs> and she said, but what's, what's interesting in the ideal gas law, there's all these assumptions that aren't quite correct. We, just, we simplified it to be able to get people to start to understand uh, all this. And she said, now with the laptops, I use uh, real gas, and I have them work on a real gas hydrogen in this case. And we start there and then move on from that. And I was like, whoa, boy, that just, that just changed the game from her uh, perspective and how she was teaching her course, which I think that'll happen here too. Yeah, I wonder how much like of this creativity, right, is actually, you know, uh, spurred on by bringing together a mixture of different perspectives and people taking a new lens on on something on a problem. So bringing together like classical and quantum with industry experts. Um, what have you guys seen in terms of like the real benefits in terms of that multidisciplinary kind of aspect as well as the collaborations that we set up uh, for quantum in particular and advancing quantum science? Yes, yeah, so um, I haven't met a person yet that's a quantum inform sci information science expert, a computational chemistry, you know, computer aid drug design expert. I think really the, the kinds of problems we're going after are so multidisciplinary, you absolutely have to collaborate, right? And, you know, in the group I'm building at the Cleveland Clinic, you know, I'm really setting up little mini teams where you're going to have like a quantum information scientist, say a quantum chemist, and then maybe someone in computer aid drug design and then try to get them to talk to each other. And a co the other problem is common language, right? And so, you know, get them to sort of work together, develop a common language to attack a, a fundamental problem. And I think if you just had, say, just the structurated drug design person, they wouldn't be able to make as much progress. So I think really collaboration and, you know, collaboration with other uh, companies, other groups, um, also, I think it's going to be really, really critical in, in moving this field forward. Mm -hmm. But it's also the point of view, right? Because if you want to build good algorithms for your problems, you need right. to be able to formulate your problem in a way that is suitable. And it's often very different than how you do classically. So you need to take a step back and get you know, someone that maybe has a different view on things to, 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 to help your, you know, just the interaction with this different way of doing things can help that direction. Otherwise, you're always repeating and, and maybe just, you know, trying to translate from classical to quantum doesn't really make sense. Right. Right? And so you need to also bring this in is the what software we... vendors, I think, you know, if you have a certain yes. user interface, you know, uh, both the method developers, but also um, packaging in such a way that it can be used at scale and, and by other people with, you know, uh, not, you know, extensive understanding of maybe all the technical details, right? Mm -hmm. That they just really want to solve their problem, mm -hmm. which is fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah, and curious, I'll just ask uh, one more question. Um, what does utility mean to each of you? Maybe we can just go down. <laughs> <laughs> so you did utility, uh, from what I've seen this morning, you know, something that I said at the beginning when I started talking and the fact that when we need to process our data, we need to go through a lot of different steps. And some of those are very efficient, some are not so efficient, some are not so elegant, some of them introduce biases according to what we already know and expect, and maybe they are not the best. Now, utility, from what I've seen today, means that maybe we could think of skipping all of those steps. Mm -hmm. And imagine a moment in which, which is not so far away in time at all, yeah. in which we could just take the output of our detectors and get out, you know, get it through a quantum algorithms and get out the physics quantities we need. 
and then we can make our discovery. And this is uh, this is a very nice concept of utility. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Travis? Yeah, I think I have a similar um, definition, though I may not be able to, to say it quite as nicely. I, I might pose it instead as an example of how I want to use utility in, in scientific discovery. And I had mentioned earlier, you know, this idea of using the quantum computer as like a proxy for the material system. And if I can do that, then I can program that computer so it mimics whatever type of material I want. It could be something that I have synthesized in the laboratory, or it could be something that I can't synthesize in the laboratory. I just don't know how to do it. Uh, think of like a room temperature superconductor. And then I go off and I try to create that material and I do a characterization of that material using my microscopes and my neutrons and my x-rays and all these types of things. And I look at that data and I come back and I look at my quantum simulation of that mo model. Mm -hmm. and, and it shows that they are either in agreement or disagreement. But I trust the quantum computer to the point that it's now informing my decision about what's actually happening in that material and how that material behaves. And now that utility gets you know, steeped in my definition of discovery and innovation. Mm -hmm. So I, I think of that as an example of what it means to me um, is this enablement of a new type of uh, paradigm for scientific innovation. Awesome, thank you. Kenny. Yeah, so utility to me, you know, once this um, quantum devices get so ubiquitous that it becomes just a standard tool in my workflow. So like I have a problem and I'm a method developer, right? I want to develop algorithms and workflows and methods to solve problems, and particularly in chemistry and biology, right? And so when I can identify a problem and say, okay, these are the steps, and this, happens, this step here happens to be perfect, you know, perfect for a quantum device, so I may use GPUs here, and then I'll call this off. And so utility is when it becomes fully integrated in my uh, computational toolkit to solve problems of interest to me. Yeah, that's what it's done. So. John? You know, very similar to uh, the rest of the comments, although going back to this morning's uh, racing car analogy, which I thought was great. Uh, <laughs> first and foremost, I think I want the car to start up when I say start up, uh, you know, it, so it actually does what I would like it to do. But in, um, in the winters in New York, that's very in rare. In the winters in know. New York, it's going to be rare, so maybe I need a different vehicle. So, uh, But, you know, do you have the tool set? Uh, you know, we yeah. mentioned it as a tool before, but Quantum is going to be one uh, very impressive tool in our toolkit, but it's part of our toolkit. It's not, it's not the only tool that we have. It shouldn't be used as the only hammer and everything looks like a nail type of thing. Uh, yeah. This is, there's, there's a number of other tools we have. How does it integrate well? How does it uh, work to, you know, as Kenny said, you set up a problem and you can find the, the right pieces of software, hardware, firmware to go after it. And, it, and it just works and you're not worried about, uh, you know, what's funny now is when I give presentations on quantum, and I'm sure it's true for all of you, uh, you're immediately into some discussion about what kind of quantum is it? Is it trapped ion? Is it Josephine Junction? Is it something else? Which is interesting. I find that interesting, but that's not how we get to utility. Right. How we get to utility is how do you build that stack that people mentioned this morning and how does that stack work effectively for you to solve Maybe problems? device independent as well. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. All right, I think on that note, I want to thank all of you for a really great thank discussion you. today. This has been excellent and want to continue the conversation. So the panelists have kindly offered to continue the conversation with each of you. If you would like to, after the session, they'll be around for the rest of uh, the day today. So thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you, Jane. All right.